Good afternoon, and welcome to a day in the life of a Netflix engineer abusing, using 37% of the internet. If this is not the talk that you're here for, now would be the time to go. A little bit about me. My name is Dave Hahn. I'm a senior, lots of things, engineer in the critical operations and response engineering team at Netflix. What does that lots of things mean? I'm involved in our operations. I'm involved in our crisis handling. I do some of our cloud architecture. I work on performance of our stack. Care a lot about reliability. I help people get insight into their running services. I'm concerned about our network performance. I spend a lot of time engaging with our partners, like Amazon. And I get to do some hardware and software things as well. Overall, though, my job is to make things better. I'm part of the core team, the, the critical operations and response engineering team. It's important to have a pronounceable acronym for your team's name. It means you're important. <laughs> Thank you. My team is responsible for crisis management. You press that play button and you don't quite get what you expect. We provide a lot of the availability reporting, the numbers that drive the rest of the organization to tell them how they're doing. Reliability best practices. We're interested in talking with people about how do they make reliable services and run them in the cloud. We're primarily uh, the people responsible for our AWS relationship, and we do a lot of operations education to help people understand how best to operate things in the cloud. The team is made up of SREs, service reliability engineers. It's their job to have an excellent understanding of how the different parts of the Netflix ecosystem fit together and how that ecosystem runs in the cloud. We also have program managers on our critical operations team. We have, uh, we have them there because they focus on communication, follow-up, making sure some of those risk mitigation kind of things get done. So we have technical people focusing on technical things and communication people focusing on communication things. We also have crisis leaders. Crisis leaders uh, have an important role in that it's their job to understand both the technical aspect of a decision as well as the business impact of a decision. So that we're in one of those really tough moments where you have to make a call one direction or the other, they understand both of those and they can lead the charge forward. It's the core team. The core team has some goals that we find to be important. This is one of the first ones. It is our job to protect the customer experience. As we find our customers enjoy the service most when it's available and operational. Okay, good, keep up with me, that was a joke. There's more of them and they don't get a whole lot better. If any of you have ever monitored uh, social networking like Twitter when there is that occasional Netflix outage, you'll notice some people believe they're going to die. I wanted to let you know we've checked, nobody has actually died. See, I warned you they weren't going to get a whole lot better. So, protecting the customer experience. We want to focus on technologies, practices, and behaviors that protect our customer experience. Things like graceful degradation, failover, fail back. That whole category of things where something is better than nothing. Those of you that have used the service, I, I assume there are a couple of Netflix users in here. What great, wonderful support. Thank you. I, a couple of hands. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Those of you that have used the service have probably seen something like this. This is where you can surf around a bit and see what kind of content is available. We call this Lolamo, list of list of movies. There you go. There's your secret Netflix word, Netflix word of the day, worth the cost of admission right there. I keep telling you they're not going to get better. <laughs> So, Lolomo, your list of list of movies. Now, as you can imagine, there's a service that provides this list of list of movies for you. We try to customize and personalize each one of our customers' experiences. So your Lolomo is unique. Now, imagine with me, if you will, that that service isn't having such a great day. I have a couple of options on how I can design that. Here's one possible experience. Glad you understand. I have, however, um, I've put up the argument with, uh, with the teams that drive the UI that we should replace it with this. <laughs> that way, if we're having problems, we're at least making healthy life recommendations. <laughs> but if we go back to this, so this Lolomo. Imagine that that service, again, is not behaving quite correctly. So I can give you that can't connect to Netflix um, message, which I think we can all agree is suboptimal. 
but could I do something different? Could I maybe get uh, recommendations that are for people that I perceive to be like you, or maybe in your geographic area, or if nothing else, at least, you know, something? Something is better than nothing. This pervades the way we talk about architecting software and architecting our footprint in the cloud. We always want to have, when possible, the best possible experience for our customers. However, knowing that things will go wrong, we want to make sure we're still protecting that customer experience. Here's another example. I tried to use some technical terms here, so I'll walk you through them. US East, a bad thing happened. OK, no questions on that. Good. An automated reaction took over, moved that traffic over to our implementation in US West until US East could, uh, could stabilize, and then we moved the traffic back, protecting the customer experience, the number one goal of the team. The other things that we do, unique failures. Why not have no failures, right? No, no hands in the air for that one? OK, I'll keep going. Netflix prizes what we call the velocity of innovation. I want software developers developing new features and getting them out there for our customers to use. I want our user experience designers trying new things. I want UI designers finding new ways for you to engage with the service. That velocity of innovation is very, very important at Netflix. So we know that things will go wrong, and we are willing to trade some availability to maintain that velocity of innovation. So instead of assume that those failures aren't going to happen, we know they're going to happen but I want that thing to only happen once. I want each failure to be unique and interesting and new. So how do we do that? We'll talk a little bit more later, but things like good incident review processes, getting everyone together where you can, uh, where, where your environment where you have safe, honest, and open feedback, and you can talk about what actually happened and why. And this is particularly important for what we call getting to the real root cause. So let me give you an example of what I mean. We had a failure a little while ago where a little problem with the service, and we got the people together later on and said, you know, what, what happened? What, what caused that thing to go in that direction? And one of the engineers, you know, put his hand up in the air and said, I put the wrong number into a thing and hit a button, and it very quickly did the thing I asked it to do, and our entire service turned off. Now, it would be very easy to say, well, you know, human error, right? How do we fix human error? Please don't do that again. But we take the time to actually dig into it, and we walked through the tool he was using and understanding what he was trying to figure out. And what we learned by taking the time to find the real root cause is that we had a piece of tooling in the environment that made it too easy for people to do the wrong thing. Had we not done that, had we just said human error and moved along, there's a good chance somebody else would have come along, and they would have used that tool, and they would have done the wrong thing, and I would not be keeping with my goals to have unique failures. So we spend a lot of time making sure we understand why things fail, what contributed to those failures, and how we make sure that they don't happen again so that we meet our goal of both protecting the customer experience and having unique failures. Constant improvement, I think, is kind of a natural outcome of that. If you have an environment where you're regularly talking about what happened and how you got there, you're going to continue to improve. But we highlight it because I think sometimes we forget about it. Those of us that live in the operations world, uh, making sure these things you know, work globally all the time, you can get into a mode to where you're just putting out the next fire and putting out the next fire and putting out the next fire. Remembering that part of our job is constant improvement helps to make that a bit better because we know we're moving along better. How do we do that? I'm a strong believer in you can't change things you don't measure. So at Netflix, we measure everything. We'll talk about, a bit, we'll talk about that a bit more. A little bit about Netflix. Netflix is a media and entertainment company that has the simple goal to delight our customers and win moments of truth. What is that moment of truth? Well, this is a moment. This is when you or someone like you or this honest to God, really, really real family here <laughs> sits down and decides what's, you know, what to do with the time they have for entertainment. And when they pick Netflix, we win. So the goal of the company is to win those moments of truth. So how do we do that? The first thing is engaging and compelling content. It would not matter if I could run a service with 100% perfect availability, the best possible performance I could squeeze out of it, and the smallest possible Amazon bill if nobody wants to watch what I have. So compelling and engaging entertainment is our first ingredient. Having the service be available is still important. Once we do that, finding ways for people to better engage with what we have, find what they're looking for, there's that Lolomo example again. 
special Netflix word. We'll try different things. Here's a different view. A little bit more detail about this particular, uh, about this particular show as opposed to the smaller amount of detail before. So you'll notice that there are, you know, there are changes, there are differences. We have an enormous A-B uh, testing infrastructure. We are constantly testing. We're very data-driven. And we'll try different things, and whichever one works out the best for our customers will win. It's also interesting to note that that means your Netflix, your Netflix experience is probably very unique as compared to anyone else's. Our customers are typically in about 13 or so uh, tests at any given time. So once you get good engagement, you can start to play with things. So here we're mixing media a little bit. Here's our friend Lola Mo again as somebody's scroll, uh, scrolling through. But we've taken one of the lines and we've made it a cinematic experience. We've broken up that video across those different panes. This is, uh, this is for Beasts of No Nation, a Netflix original film available on October 16th. And this may be how you see it on the service. So now we have good compelling content. We have good ways for people to interface with the service. We try to tweak that a little bit for our audiences. This is one I find particularly interesting. I have, I have kids at home, and this is our kids' interface. This came out of a, uh, out of a supposition uh, by one of our engineers that kids uh, think differently about entertainment than adults do, whereas we might think about movie titles or television shows or seasons and particular episodes. Kids have characters that they want to see, so we built an interface specifically so kids could pick a character. Doesn't matter what movie or TV show they're in. They can watch Toothless or King Julian or The Penguins of Madagascar or Peppa Pig or Barbie very simply by interfacing with the service. So how did we get there? The Netflix cloud journey. Netflix started as a DVD by mail company in 1997. About 10 years later, in 2007, we started streaming out of the Netflix data centers. In 2008, there was an inconvenient fire in one of the Netflix data centers. Fires, by the way, not good for availability. But it caused us to reconsider, what should we be doing? Do we, do we build more data centers? Do we try to get better fire suppression? What kinds of things do we do? And the decision was made that becoming an excellent data center operations company does not help us necessarily meet the goals of winning moments of truth. So we started our move to the cloud. So we started that move in 2009. By 2010, we had the first devices streaming from our new, uh, from our new uh, Amazon infrastructure in US East One. 2011, we'd stood up our service in EU West One for our EU customers. 2012, December 24th, ELB as a service melts down in US East One. Anybody remember that one? A few hands, yeah, I was on call. That one's burned into my brain. It again caused us to change the way we think. So we decided we needed to start having a better multi-regional strategy. So by 2013, we were also operating in US West 2, and we could run customers out of either one. By 2015, our cloud migration was complete. Those of you good at math, that's a long time. So what is the Netflix architecture uh, on top of Amazon Web Services that makes us uh, you know, be able to send this out to our customers? First bit is Open Connect. A few years ago, Netflix started building our own purpose-driven, single-purpose CDN. All of your video bits stream to you from uh, an Open Connect appliance installed in one of our hundreds of peering locations around the world. We're in lots of IXs, and better yet, we're even embedded within the ISP networks, so those video bits get to you even faster. Everything else that is Netflix, metadata systems, customer information, compute, algorithms, front ends, all of those kinds of things run off of our Amazon Web Services infrastructure. So what does that look like? We have a global deployment. We currently operate in three regions. And as of, uh, as of recently, we can serve any customer anywhere in the world from any one of those regions. So it doesn't matter if there's a problem in one region. I can handle you from anywhere. So the Netflix architecture itself. Netflix is a service-oriented architecture uh, composed of loosely coupled elements that have bounded contexts. Anybody recognize that as an Adrian Cockroft definition? OK, I'll move on. There are some important bits there, though. Loosely coupled, the services are independent. They can be coded, tested, upgraded, and managed completely independently. And because they have bounded context, those services are completely self-contained. You may recognize this as a microservices architecture. That's the way Netflix is put together. We have hundreds of, mar of, of microservices, everything from one service that talks about that video metadata, another one that's about customer information, 
another one that makes that Lolomo stuff that we talk about. We have hundreds and hundreds of microservices. We're currently over uh, a little over 700 microservices that make the Netflix service as it is. It looks like this. Those of you taking notes, I'll give you a moment. <laughs> this is not particularly helpful. And it's missing a few things. Not only is it confusing, Netflix is an ever-changing environment. That advantage of microservices that allows a service team to make changes and deploy to the production environment whenever they see fit means that this is a moving target. So we've developed a few internal tools to help us understand our architecture, because as soon as you were to say, write something down in that documentation, it's going to suffer from bit rot that instant and be incorrect, because three other service teams have already pushed out some new data. So for instance, here's an internal tool we have called SALP. SALP works off of the actual calls made from one service to another. So now I don't have to try to understand what the dependencies are for a particular service I can see. And it's also self-documenting. Since it's actually built off of live calls that are made, this is always accurate. So for instance, you'll see there's that Lolomo thing again. There really is a service that makes Lolomo. There's all the things that it has to talk to in order to give you that list of list of movies. We can even drill in a little bit further, and it gets a little bit more legible, but you get the idea. We have a self-documenting system. So the Netflix ecosystem itself, we discussed that was made up of hundreds of microservices. There are thousands of daily production changes. Anybody just have a little shiver when I said that? Okay. We run tens of thousands of instances, and we'll cycle out anywhere from 15 to 20% of those instances on a normal day. We have hundreds of thousands of customer interactions per minute. We have millions of customers. We have billions of metrics. And as of last quarter, we provided over 10 billion hours of entertainment to our customers. And we have tens of operations people. <laughs> Here's the other one that's kind of fun. We also don't have a knock. We also don't have anything cleverly renamed that is a knock, but we don't call a knock. <laughs> How do we pull this off? Netflix has a DevOps culture. Now, it's normally anytime you say DevOps, you have to spend about 20 minutes explaining what you mean by DevOps, right? I've given you a preview to the next 20 minutes. Or to borrow another phrase, in order to understand DevOps, one must first understand DevOps. In the Netflix DevOps culture, we have a 100% ownership culture. The teams that are responsible for a microservice make the decisions about what language to write it in, what storage systems they're going to use, their data models, their caching architecture. They code it, they test it, they deploy it, they run it, and they support it. They're also on call 24-7 in order to do that. We don't have the, um, I hate to call it traditional, but maybe traditional, over the fence to operations kind of architecture when software is created at Netflix. There's no software team that creates it, runs it through a release engineer, which then actually you know, graces it and pushes it out to the production environment. And then there's an operations group that that's responsible for operating the thing, particularly when it fails. Because oftentimes, in those scenarios, being the operations person, you hope that there's good and accurate documentation that's up to date. Maybe there's a run book that tells you what to do. And a lot of times, they'll say, go look at this log file. Great, this runs on 600 instances. Which one do I pick? Let's assume I pick the right one and I get to the log file and invariably there'll be, there'll be one of those error entries in a log file that says, well, this shouldn't happen. <laughs> if you recall my goals from earlier on protecting the customer experience, that does not protect the customer experience. Why would I take someone whose expertise is in operations and try to make them uh, you know, a software engineer that happened to write this piece of software that understands what it's supposed to do when I actually have the software developers that wrote this piece of software and understand what it's supposed to do? So we engage with our service teams that own that software when there are problems. So I have the world experts on how that thing is supposed to be operating right there with me, protecting my customer experience. So what else do we do? We talked a little bit about instant reviews earlier and the velocity of innovation. I bring it up again because it's extremely, extremely important that you have good, healthy instant reviews or post-mortems or whatever phrase we're using in the DevOps world this week to say we're going to get everybody together and we're going to talk about what happened and figure out why. These other things start to fall apart. Having software engineers on call 
doesn't work out well if all we're doing is just pushing a page to them and leaving them by themselves. Healthy incident reviews are very, very important. Honest and open feedback, again, part of that, I bring it up again because things will go wrong. Some new piece of hotness will go out there and break all the old stuff. Without fail, it will go wrong. Somebody will try something new, they'll make a bad judgment call, it will go wrong. But if you don't have a place where they can talk about that and review that and figure it out, we're not going to have unique failures. We won't be protecting our customer experience. So this is a bit about the Netflix culture as well. Uh, we have the Netflix culture deck, perhaps some of you have heard about that. It's a uh, slide presentation that talks about the ingredients that make up the Netflix culture and what we think is important. You can find that at jobs.netflix.com if you want to peruse a few of the other things that are important in our culture. Second thing on how do we do this. With the DevOps culture, we want to make sure we have easy ownership. What I mean by that, I've now taken a group of software engineers that are good at writing a software service and said, oh, by the way, I also need you to be a successful release engineer. I need you to be a good operations engineer, and you really need to be a really good service reliability engineer. So, you know, just don't screw that up, okay? That's not reasonable. We want them to own it. We want them to be successful owning it. So we try to make it as easy as possible for them to be successful owning their service. So we've created a set of software, um, different tools that our software engineers use that we think makes ownership easier. So for instance, one category, service discovery. If we go back to that microservices picture again, the really clear, clear blue one, assume that you're a, a service owner and you've created this new service and you need to go get membership information or Lolomo information or you need to publish a metric or you need to look something up from data storage. What instances do that? How do I talk to them? How do I make sure that when that service team changes something that my stuff isn't going to break? So we created a service discovery software called Eureka. Eureka maintains that information not only on what instances do what, but how to talk to them, what ports to talk to them on, what protocol to talk to them on. So now all you have to do is you make a single call and say, I would like to push a metric. And Eureka answers back, these instances would love to talk to you about that, and here's how you do it. We have another piece of software called ETA. And there are times when you need information about your objects inside of AWS. Having 800 engineers constantly calling the EC2 API gets you throttled. Uh, if you've ever run into that, that's happened to us a few times. So we've created ETA as kind of a cache so that all of our objects are kept there, along with their history. So we also get the benefit of history as opposed to just current information. So one example of, of uh, easy ownership, we've made service discovery easy. There we go. Solid communication. We have microservices talking to each other across a network that none of us have seen, through routers we haven't configured, potentially through peering connections we know nothing about. Occasionally things are going to go wrong. So now in order to make, uh, in order to meet my goal of protecting my customer experience, do I now also tell my software developers, I'd really like it if you were a great network engineer as well. Again, probably not gonna make me successful. So we have another set of tools that they can use. We have, a, we have a tool called Ribbon. And Ribbon handles all of that communication in between these different services. It handles how do I talk to them, how long should I try to talk to them, how do I do my exponential back off, you know, all those details that are important, but vary from service to service. Ribbon handles that for all of my software developers. We have another tool called Hystrix. Hystrix helps to isolate network faults and protect the application. This is kind of a visualization of what happens. If we start over there at the left-hand side during that green area, we have an excellent set of communications from one service calling another one. At some point, the service being called, some of the instances start to become unhealthy. Well, the calling service is notified via Hystrix to go into a failback mode and start providing some other experience to my customers. You can see it gets worse. The blue almost covers everything. That entire service is almost gone. However, after a little while, the service recovers and we go green again. Now the entire time, my customers were not impacted at all, so I'm protecting the customer experience. I'm also making ownership easy because this was all automated. Just by using Hystrix, they got this advantage. Nobody got woken up, nobody had to log on to anything and you know, turn a dial or flip a bit or do something different. This all happened, both the failure and the recovery in an automated fashion. So now I've removed, to a degree, the pain and difficulty of operating in a large network environment for my software developers. The right thing happens easily. Continuous deployment. This is tough. 
it was tough to do well. I, I joke that uh, the goal of my software developers is to put the appy thing in the cloudy thing. They really like it when I describe their job that way. <laughs> All of us who've done deployments uh, you know, in, in Amazon understand there's actually a lot of pieces there that are both important and complicated. We're picking instances and scaling rules and potentially attaching ELBs and security groups. There's lots of different things that we need to do around the code to make this a healthy running service. I want to pull that away or abstract it away or remove it as much as I can from my software developer's requirements. Those of you that have used uh, Asgard, one of our open source projects, um, Asgard, uh, we've sunset Asgard, and this is a view of its replacement Spinnaker. Spinnaker is a continuous deployment integration tool. One of the primary goals of Spinnaker is that we should be able to look at this, see things quickly, understand a lot about the running application with no training. We can see, I'm, I'm, we're, we're looking at API proxy, big font up there in the left-hand corner. You see it's made up of a good number of instances. A few of those aren't healthy. A few of them are in a little bit of an odd state. I see an icon telling me there are ELBs around. I see how many instances there should be. I can see what the launch configuration was. You can see that too, and we didn't have to do any training on it. So I've made it easy now, once that software is up and running, for them to get important information about how their software is running. How about getting there? We use deployment pipelines in Spinnaker. We want deployment pipelines to do a couple of things. We want it to be easy, so deployment pipeline can be kicked off by something like a commit to a repository. We also want to make sure it meets those other goals, like protecting the customer experience. So you can see in some of the uh, older deployments down there toward the bottom of the screen, that set of code failed some tests. Could have failed smoke tests, could have failed compatibility tests, could have failed squeeze tests, could have failed performance tests. I don't know if anyone's heard about our automated canary analysis, making sure your new code is as good as your old code. All of those things are evaluated before that code gets out there into the environment. And if it fails, Spinnaker stops it from getting out there. If it's successful, it handles all the rest of it, spinning up new instances, whatever other associations need to be done. Everything else happens automatically, making ownership and deployment easy. Data persistence. This is another one that's hard. There, there are different data storage engines, and there are data models, and there are TTLs for things, and, and caching systems, and well, lots of different ways to do things. So we set these up as services for our software developers. So instead of now both having to run, a, run the service they're responsible for, they also don't, do not have to be database administrators, just like they did not have to be network engineers. So we have software available that makes data persistence in the cloud easier. We run things like EV Cache and Dynamite our versions of uh, Memcache and Redis that we think run best at scale and cover our replication needs. We also have Astianix and Dyno, which are client libraries that make accessing cloud-based data very simple. Similar to Hystrix, it makes uh, my understanding of that entire data structure system and who to talk to and where to go get things, I don't have to worry about it. I make a simple call, all of the hard operation is handled for me, and my data is handed back to me. Insight. Insight into the running operations, into the services, into the microservices is extremely important for meeting those goals. Frankly, insight's also a hard thing to do. There are lots of different places where we're looking for effective insight into things. They might be metrics on a particular, uh, uh, on a particular running application or, a, or an instance that's behaving badly or something, but it turns into a hard problem to make sure you have all the insight you need when you need it. So again, this is something we try to set up and make, uh, make easy for easy ownership. There we go. So we have a piece of software called Atlas. Atlas is our, time, is our uh, largely dimensional time series data storage, and data storage system for near real time operational insight. I had to practice that one a few times. I still didn't get it right. Netflix runs a lot of metrics. I mentioned earlier we're a, we're a data-driven company, not only on picking content and providing content and recommending content, but also on getting insight into our operations. We looked at lots of different options that were available for time series databases. We struggled to find something that was both large enough and fast enough for our needs, so we developed a piece of software called Atlas. Atlas currently runs a little under 2.5 billion metrics per minute every hour of every day for Netflix. Great, we have metrics. Now you just have to find one. 
2.5 billion metrics. The, uh, the manager of the Insight uh, team, I think, did some experiment where he looked at, if, if I take a retina display and I have one pixel for every metric that we have, if I have enough 15-inch displays, if I go 90 feet high, I can have one pixel for every metric. Now we have a different problem. The metrics exist. We need to make finding them and engaging with them easy. So this is part of Atlas here. It makes it easy for uh, you know, a couple of clicks for me to see what metrics are available, what they look like, how they might fit together, what I can do with them. We make it easy then to turn that into a dashboard where I can relay the information. However, again, with 2.5 billion metrics, having people stare at dashboards, we don't have a screen that big. So our insight team makes sure we go a step further. How do we garner the correct attention for something that's having a problem, a signal that's you know, demonstrating something interesting out of those 2.5 billion metrics? So for instance, here we see a, uh, the signal is the blue line. We have a predictor of what the blue line should not go below. That's kind of the surfing red line below it. You'll see it's kind of tracking the signal there. And then there are the green bars. The green bars show any time that that signal went below the predictor. So you can see where it really fell off the cliff, it went below the predictor. So the goal of the Insight team is to make publication of complex metrics simple, to make retrieving complex metrics simple, to make visualization and analysis of complex metrics simple, to make building automation, which is what you need to do with 2.5 billion metrics, and to protect your customer experience so that computers, you know, computers react faster than we do, to build automation on top of metrics simple. You might have noticed a pattern there as to the goals of the inside operations team. Metrics only tell you part of the story. Like we're saying, we have a lot of these. How do I turn this from interesting data into useful information for my software teams? We have a few other tools. This is a tool called Mogul. Mogul helps uh, service owners introspect their particular service and see how it's being impacted by dependence and dependencies, network calls, downstream errors, those kinds of things. Again, the tool is designed to be simple so that anyone can use it to introspect their service and figure out what's going on. This is a uh, uh, piece of software called Slalom. What's common in the Netflix infrastructure is that I, as I'm building a microservice, I may pull in a client that allows me to easily access another microservice. I may pull in two or three of those. All of a sudden now I've created some dependency on other services I may not be, even be aware of. One that I'm dependent on them, two, how much I'm dependent on them. This tool allows them to easily see that dependency chain and uh, gives them an idea based on relative size how dependent they are. This is Vector. Vector allows us to easily introspect the behavior of a specific instance. High resolution, highly granular data about how their particular piece of software is behaving on that particular instance. They can get an idea how they're using memory or how the CPU is behaving. Another important thing in how we answered this how question is what we call cloud thinking. For those of you that were born in the cloud and molded by the cloud, this next little bit will feel very natural. Those of you that have physical data centers and are accustomed to managing physical equipment, this part's important. You cannot import all of your data center or physical hardware thinking into your cloud model. And by that, I don't mean you just tweak it a little bit, you don't change it a little bit, you don't you know, dust a little off the top. You have to change completely the way you're thinking. I'll give you an example. I've, I've done lots of years in the data center, and I've made the cloud transition myself, and I have the gray hair, or remaining gray hair to prove it. I told you the jokes weren't getting better. In the data center, we tried to avoid failure by identifying single points of failure and moving around them. Right, we'd have two power connections going to a particular machine. Those connections would go to different power buses. Those power buses would go to UPSs, and the UPSs would be backed up by generators. And if it was really important information, we might have another layer of generators. And we may even try to feed those from two different points on the power grid. We did the same thing with our network connectivity. We had more than one physical connection out to different switches to different network paths so that a failure in a certain place wouldn't cut us off. We put disks in servers. We put lots of disks in there. We put RAID controllers in there to make it logical on how those were going to work together. And we put multiple RAID controllers in there in case one of those failed that we, you know, we weren't going to have a failure. We tried to avoid failure by getting around those single points of failure. Interestingly enough, and the reason I chose this picture, 
We always had the lights, right? We had drive lights, we had drive error lights, we had network connectivity lights, we had network activity lights. We had power indicator lights, I had raid lights. I had lights and lights and lights and lights and lights. And you get accustomed to be able to looking down that row and see all those lights and recognizing patterns and maybe a color that's off and using that to get an idea where your failure may be coming at you. In the cloud, you never get to see the lights. I call this having verbs, not nouns. So in part of that cloud transition, you no longer have loud ba load balancers. You have the advantage of load balancing. I no longer have networks and switches and routers. I have a fabric that delivers my packets for me. It's an important way that you start to think because it'll change the metrics that you look at. It'll change the way you architect applications. It'll change all the assumptions you've made about how you operate in the cloud. What you start to realize and what you start to think about is you're no longer thinking about a data center or network-centric implementation. You're thinking about simply a business implementation on top of an infrastructure that you don't have to think about. One of the last ones on how, remove surprises. I'm sure everybody's going, wouldn't that be nice? No, I would like zero surprises, please. So how do we do that? There are, some, there are certain guarantees or promises that the cloud makes for you. Your instances will die. One, one of my TAMs has a quote. He likes quite a bit. Instances are cattle. They're not pets. You don't get to name them. <laughs> there are lots of reasons those instances might be going away, and some of them are very good reasons. You may be auto-scaling. I mentioned earlier we auto-scale those tens of thousands and thousands and thousands of instances. Some of them come, some of them go. You may get one of those occasional emails from Amazon that says, hey, that piece of hardware your instance is running on, it's not so good. Or there's that rare occasion where human error may get rid of an instance for you. The important thing to think about or to adjust your thinking about is that the impact is the same. That instance is going away. It's been one of the stated requirements at Netflix that the loss of a single instance should not affect your running service. I would go as far to say to you that if the loss of a single instance impacts your service, you're doing the cloud wrong because you're guaranteed those instances are going to go away. It may live for minutes, it may live for hours, it may live for months, it may live for years, but those instances are gonna go away. So how do we adjust our thinking around that? So your favorite instance dies. How do we prevent that from being a problem? Netflix talks a lot about stateless applications. As that instance comes up and it becomes part of your application or part of your service, there should be nothing special about it. As it leaves, there should be nothing special about it. There should not be that one special instance in a cluster that has the one file, that has the key, that has the piece of information, that if it goes away, the whole thing falls down. But you are going to have to store some data. So we talk about high data spread and redundancy. We use Cassandra for storing a lot of our data. I mentioned earlier that we are in three Amazon regions. We always run in three availability zones. So for our Cassandra rings, that means that I'm going to have one instance in each availability zone that has my row of data, and I'm gonna have that across each of my regions. So that's a three by three fashion. So I have nine copies of my data. There's my redundancy. It means I'm gonna have to lose a lot of instances before I lose any data. High data spread and redundancy so your applications are truly stateless. Production, failure, injection. This is a fun one, at least, least for me. How many of you have seen these, you know, this, this Motley crew before? I saw some hands, thank you. Those of you that really like them, we do have stickers at the booth. We've learned it's very important we bring stickers with us to these things. The Simeon Army does a few very specific things for Netflix. For instance, there in the dead center on the bottom is Chaos Monkeys, the short one, double fist in the guns. Chaos Monkey does one very simple thing. I'm gonna teach you how to make your own Chaos Monkey in about five lines of insert your favorite you know, programming language here. Pick a random list of instances, shoot them in the head twice. <laughs> That's all Chaos Monkey does functionally. But let's understand what Chaos Monkey does for your organization. I said earlier that the loss of a single instance should not affect your running service. Chaos Monkey guarantees that for Netflix. We know those instances are going to go away. So every hour of every day, in the production environment, Chaos Monkey is killing instances for us. You know, I saw a few people shiver when I said production environment. 
It's been over two years since the activity of Chaos Monkey has caused any kind of problems our customers have noticed. We are not impacted by the loss of a single instance. Now, we wanted to take that further. You'll notice he has a bit of a big brother there, Chaos Gorilla, the guy with the bazooka. We decided, you know, we should be able to lose an availability zone and not have it impact our services. So we made sure our software is architected that way, and we started running Chaos Gorilla, and we knock out a zone. Then we get even bigger. The big ghostly guy there in the back, that's Chaos Kong. Those of you who have noticed a pattern may kind of see where I'm progressing to. Chaos Kong kills a region. About every four weeks or so, we nuke a region. I'll give you a minute to let that sink in. What does that look like? This is a real-time traffic visualization tool we have called Flux. You'll see we're talking two, three regions around the world. US West 2 is going to start to become unhealthy. It gets a little unhealthy, and then it gets a little bit more unhealthy. Remember, I want to protect my customer experience. So I start redirecting that traffic from US West 2 to US East 1. We do that at a, at a proxy layer we have called Zool that sits right behind our ELBs. So at this point, there's no activity in US West 2 except a redirection activity. Then I update my DNS records so that US West 2 is no longer a valid DNS record for anything in Netflix, and I'll see that traffic drain away completely. Chaos Kong is the tool that we use to do this. US West 2 will start to become healthy again, and you'll see the process reverse. The important thing is that we do this at least once a month and that our customers don't notice. Occasionally, things haven't gone well. Some of you might have noticed. <laughs> the vast majority, but none of you died. Remember, we talked about that earlier. <laughs> the vast majority of the time that we run this exercise, our customers don't notice. You see, we've gone back to a, we've gone back to a steady state. This allows us to have problems in Amazon that are regionally based and for me to protect my customer experience. Whether that was that, you remember that ELB thing from 2012? Some of you may know about the recent DynamoDB challenge that happened in US East. We use this tool, the Chaos Kong tool, and we visualized it with Flux to protect our customer experience. A few other cloud guarantees to take seriously. You're going to share resources with other people, right? This is a virtualized environment. I hope it's not a surprise if I tell you that some of your neighbors don't always behave in the best fashion. However, if we take that seriously and we think about some of those tools we talked about earlier, like Ribbon and Hystrix, that help us to isolate unhealthy portions of our system, it doesn't matter. You don't have to aggressively worry that you have a situation where you're co-tenant with somebody who isn't behaving well. That instance will be pulled away. Nobody else will talk to it. It will not affect your service. The architecture will change out from underneath you. I think I'm probably not alone if I say I've poked around the Amazon infrastructure before trying to figure out where my stuff lives and what I'm next to. Anybody else ever done that? Got a few hands on, yeah, I've tried that. The architecture will change out from under you for lots of good reasons. Network upgrades, droplet changes, all of those kinds of things. Stop thinking about where you are in the infrastructure. Stop trying to take that data center thinking and map it onto your cloud solution. Write your applications in such a way where it doesn't matter where you are in the architecture. And a reminder that you're never going to see the lights. So with all of that kind of stuff that you know, takes care of failure for me, what is it you'd say you do here? Well, Bob, <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't have to explain that reference. <laughs> I've given that one before, and people go, who's Bob? <laughs> Netflix, it's a movie. <laughs> I do participate in some of our crisis handling, although that's honestly, it's less than 10% of my time. Remember, we don't have that many operations engineers. That core team is relatively small. We have 800 people. We have 800 engineers or so at Netflix. Less than 10% of those people are in a group we call operations engineering. Less than 10% of the people in that group bear a crisis response or operations engineering or SRE title. So for those of you doing math, that means that less than 1% of the Netflix engineering infrastructure has anything to do with operations or crisis handling directly. That's because of the other things we've talked about. We do do a bit of crisis handling. I spend a lot of time in engagement. 
I work with Amazon to talk about this is what Netflix is doing and this is what we're thinking about. I engage with other teams to learn about what they're doing. We have this big changing ecosystem. I need to kind of keep up to date on that. I do get to make some things. I think all uh, engineers, I think, are you know, mostly tinkerers at the core. So I get to make some things. So here are some of the things that I've got to make. Yes, they're all Ethernet cables. They're all sharks. There's a theme. So JAWS. We've had, a, we've had challenges in the past where oftentimes our customer service centers, where we have these large labs full of devices, Netflix is available on over 1,000 different devices, they're the ones who can reproduce a problem. And what does the engineer need? The engineer needs a traffic capture. So we tell a customer service person, what I'd like you to do is go find a laptop, three extra cables, and the one hub that is still in existence in Northern California, hook it up to that device, then I want you to start Wireshark, and I want you to fill out the filtering appropriately so that we get the right information, then I'd like you to reproduce that, and then I'd like you to email it to me. Thank you. <laughs> Not feeling a whole lot of success with that plan. So we built a little hardware device that makes it easy for anybody to replace an Ethernet cable with this little device, and they get traffic capture. The hammerhead devices. These are network quality test devices. We send these out to our network partners around the world. They install them in the last mile of their network, and it starts testing the Netflix experience from inside their network. It's really important. That means that with this tool in place, we can iron out a lot of those bugs before we have customer number one coming off that network experiencing Netflix. Shark Tank is the system that gathers all the information from the hammerheads together and makes sense out of it. Kaiju, this is our most recent one. We even have a few of our Kaiju aficionados in the audience today. We do a lot of testing of things at Netflix. And being able to create certain network situations is an important part of that test. So if we have somebody testing a new piece of software on an Xbox or a PlayStation or a Roku or you know, your favorite device here, there are times when they want to be able to create a network situation. Things like, I really need the traffic to pop out in the UK I need to be on a 5 meg DSL line, but I need 3% of packet loss so I can run this test. It's been possible in the past, but you had to chain together all of these different pieces of hardware and hope you didn't get it wrong. Kaiju is a system we developed where people can now access this as a service. So they make an API call, their device gets all of this network configuration, they can do whatever they want. So a few of the things that I've been able to make. We spend a lot of time in the core group providing education to other people around the company. Again, like I said, we don't have lots of operations engineers, but having some good operational thinking that you can apply, some things that you can understand, is extremely important for me to provide to them to help them protect the customer experience. So we spend a lot of time on education. As to what I don't do, as stated, I'm you know, one of the guys with the pager. I don't spend time tailing log files. I don't spend time reading other people's code. I don't spend time looking at run books. But the biggest thing that I don't do, and this is my favorite, is that I never feel like I'm by myself. This is important in a healthy DevOps environment. I've had times in the past when I've been the lone wolf guy. You know, it doesn't matter whose code it is, go fix it. I don't have to deal with that in the environment that I have. In our healthy DevOps environment, I know I have lots of people there that are experts in their particular systems just waiting to help me out. What I do do, it's my job to make things better. Hopefully I can make a few things better for you. I mentioned a few pieces of software as we were going through things, tools that, that uh, Netflix uses. We talked about Eureka and Ribbon and Hystrix and Etta and Spinnaker and some of the things under Spinnaker like Aminator, some of you may be familiar with, Astyanx, Dyno, Dynamite, Servo, Atlas, Vector, all of those kinds of things. <clears throat> These are all available for you to use at the Netflix OSS GitHub site, netflix.github.io. Those projects along with quite a few others, things that we've built that help us with operation or orchestration or data persistence that we have found to be beneficial to us, we like to give away to everybody else. Because if it's helped us, there's no reason it can't help you. Again, if you're curious more about the Netflix culture and uh, maybe those jobs that might be available at Netflix, we have a website for that. You can find that at jobs.netflix.com. We have a few more uh, speakers tomorrow. So we have uh, Spark and Presto on the Netflix big data platform. We also have splitting the check on compliance and security, keeping developers and auditors happy in the cloud. Those are Thursday morning at 11 a.m. 
Also, all of our speakers, myself included, will be at our, uh, at our booth to spend time answering questions. I'm Dave Hahn from the core team at Netflix. These are the places you can find me on the internet. If you enjoyed the presentation, remember to complete your evaluations. If you did not, these evaluations are not for you. <laughs>